We are the Quantum Dynamics Group at Tohoku University, and this video explains how we fabricate and test experimental semiconductor devices for our research on two-dimensional electrons. Two-dimensional electrons are formed when a conductor, such as a metal or semiconductor, is made very thin. Then, the Z direction of motion becomes unavailable, and electrons are confined to move only in a single plane. This situation can be achieved by trapping electrons inside a layered structure called a quantum well. The electrons remain inside the well because they are sandwiched between two insulating layers. We begin our device fabrication with a semiconductor wafer containing a quantum well, which has been created out of layers of aluminum, gallium arsenide, and gallium arsenide. We cut the wafer using a diamond-tipped scribing tool. First, we make a small scratch on the edge of the wafer. Then, we apply force at this location to split the wafer cleanly along one of its crystallographic directions. We repeat this process to create a square chip. Next, we produce a microscopic pattern on this chip using the process of photolithography. We apply a polymer liquid called photoresist to the chip surface, and then spin the chip to create a uniform coating. The pattern we want to produce is recorded on a photolithography mask, which is made of chromium on a glass window. We place this photolithography mask inside a machine called a mask aligner. Then place the chip on a stage below the mask. Using a microscope, we align the mask to the chip. Then we shine ultraviolet light through the mask onto the chip surface. This UV light exposure weakens the resist and allows us to remove the exposed regions using a developing fluid. The remaining resist contains our desired pattern. We next place the chip in an acid solution to chemically etch away the exposed surface regions. With the right duration of etching time, we can remove the semiconductor layers making up the quantum well. After the etching step, we wash away the photoresist by dissolving it in acetone. Next, we measure the height profile of the chip. This is to determine the depth of the etching performed. This measurement is achieved by a scanning tip. In this example, the height difference between the etched and unetched surface is 303 nanometers. 
In summary, we have used photolithography and etching to remove the quantum well from microscopically patterned regions of the chip. In the next step, we use photolithography again to add a metal pattern to the chip. After applying photoresist and patterning it, we place the chip in a vacuum metal deposition chamber. Inside the chamber is a metal that we wish to deposit onto the chip. This metal is heated by an electron beam until it evaporates. The evaporated metal gas accumulates on the chip in a thin layer. At the same time, a sensor measures the deposited metal thickness. Metals we use include gold, nickel, and titanium. Next, we dissolve away the photoresist, which also removes the metal that was deposited on top of the photoresist. The metal that remains on the chip will become the electrodes of the device. However, before these electrodes can function, they must first be heated. We heat the chip to around 400 degrees Celsius in a rapid annealing furnace filled with pure hydrogen. This causes the metal to diffuse into the chip and contact the quantum well. In addition to electrodes, we use photolithography to create metal gates on the device. A gate is a layer of metal on the device surface to which we apply a voltage. The electric field generated by the gate affects how much current can flow in the quantum well underneath it. In addition to photolithography, we also pattern the metal gates using electron beam lithography. In this technique, an electron beam resist is patterned by a 1 nanometer focused electron beam. This is performed under high vacuum inside the electron beam lithography machine. The beam must be carefully focused before the exposure. Then, the beam is scanned across the chip to write each device pattern individually. We use this technique to create metal gates with feature sizes smaller than 100 nanometers, which is much smaller than can be achieved with photolithography. The next step is to cut the chip into individual devices. We again use a diamond tip tool to scribe the surface. This time, it's necessary to align the tool and precisely pass the tip between the devices. As before, application of pressure creates a split which follows the line of the scribe.
Each small square is one device. To connect the devices to our measurement equipment, we attach them to ceramic chip carriers by a conductive silver paste. We then use a wire bonding machine to connect each metal electrode and gate on the device to a separate pin of the chip carrier. These connections are made by a thin aluminum wire which is bonded by an ultrasonic pulse. We manually align each wire by the aid of a microscope. As an alternative to ceramic chip carriers, we also create printed circuit boards, or PCBs, for our devices. We design and assemble these PCBs with their connectors. We then attach each device to a PCB with the aid of a die bonding machine using silver paste. Using a sharp needle, we apply silver paste to each contact point of the PCB. Then, we carefully align the device electrodes to the contact points and place the device on the PCB. Next, it is time to test the devices, which we do by connecting the chip carrier to a probe. We place this probe inside a cryostat containing liquid helium at a temperature of 4.2 Kelvin or minus 269 degrees Celsius. We set the temperature of the sample chamber to 4.2 Kelvin and wait for the sample to cool to this temperature. This low temperature is needed to prevent the electrons in the quantum well from escaping and behaving as 3D electrons. We then measure the device's resistance while applying a magnetic field. This tells us the density and mobility of the 2D electrons. After finding a working device, we perform our main research experiments in a dilution refrigerator that cools down to 40 millikelvin, which is just 40 thousandths of a degree above absolute zero. Our dilution refrigerator contains high-frequency cables, optical fibers, and a microscope for performing high-speed electrical measurements and optical measurements on the device at low temperature. The dilution refrigerator weighs about 20 kilograms and must be manipulated with a crane.